Dr. Longo, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for making the trip out here. I'm excited to talk to you. Well, great to talk to you, Rich. I uh, had our mutual friend, Joel Kahn, on the show a couple months ago. He was out here and um, he was singing your praises. I was familiar with your work, but he just went on and on and on. And that <laughs> created quite an impact uh, with the audience. So there's been a lot of anticipation and excitement about you um, sharing uh, your wisdom with yeah, us. And he's so, an excellent doctor. Yeah, he's very cool. Um, so, so many things to talk about. I think uh, probably the best way to approach this is sort of to bifurcate it uh, between a discussion about longevity and then we can get into the fasting mimicking diet protocol um, that you talk about. But to kind of contextualize this, it would probably be good to hear a little bit about your background and what got you interested in aging and longevity to begin with? Yeah, so I started um, actually very early. I was a music major back in college. So my second year, I think I always wanted to do aging, uh, do research on aging because uh, as soon as I I had an opportunity to change, I was immediately sure I wanted to study aging. And uh, so I switched to the biochemistry department and that's all I've ever done uh, since then. And that was uh, 30 years ago. Yeah, so. had something to do with uh, having to lead lead the band or like the marching band yeah, or something yeah, that, that just crushed the rock star dream. Yeah, so they asked me <laughs> to, uh, to direct the marching band and I said, there's no way I'm gonna do that. <laughs> And uh, they say, well, you know, this is the program. If you don't mm-hmm. do that, you got to find something else. And so you know, within a couple of days, I, I was in biochemistry and uh, I think it was a good switch. And uh, yeah, so. Why, what, good, good but choice. what was the impetus? Like, what, where did that interest in longevity come from? Is that from growing up where you grew up in Italy? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, I speculate that maybe uh, I was five years old when I, my, father, my grandfather died but I was in the room when he died. You know, usually you keep mm-hmm. five-year-olds away from from the actual moment where somebody dies, and uh, and maybe you know I acted very grown up at the time. But maybe that that stuck in my head that right. people die, and you know, um, and and that, so that was very early in in my life that I had to face that. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, I always wanted to look for the opportunity to start study mm-hmm. aging. Right. And how why could, do I, how could I prevent this from happening? Yes, yes. And of course, then I started probably thinking about me and my parents and, and all of that. And, and so, yeah, I, I suspect maybe, maybe it had nothing to do with that. But the fact that I was so sure that I had to study aging, mm-hmm. I, I, I suspect that it had more to do than just uh, a, a topic in college. Yeah, it's interesting because most people might find themselves attracted to science or biochemistry or becoming a doctor, but you were very specific in what it is that you wanted to explore. Yes, specific. And also I picked biochemistry because at the time, 19 years old, I just thought biology and chemistry, that's probably going to be good to to know both, uh, to address the the, the problem of aging. And, uh, but also I think that I mean, it's hard to to remember what I thought at, the, at that time, but certainly the the potential for medicine to me was also pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. You know, I just had spent a few years in Chicago with my relatives there. I came from Italy, <clears throat> but then in Chicago, I started seeing all these cardiovascular disease and diabetes in my my relatives, which are 100% genetically from Southern Italy. Mm-hmm. And I never saw that in, in, in Southern Italy. I mean, I saw it, but not like that. It was very obvious, very early in the 50s and 60s. And so that I think also was a factor uh, in my head. And um, and so in Texas, the diet uh, was also very poor, uh, you know, this Tex-Mex. Uh, right. So I, I guess it went right, from right, right. bad to worse at Chicago and Dallas. Um, and, and then, you know, then eventually LA, with Roy Walford, who uh, was one of the guru of nutrition and longevity, I, I had the opportunity to go back to this uh, ideal, or at least I- understanding of what diet, uh, um, what, which diet is good and which is bad. And, and he certainly was, the, the, his lab was certainly the place to, uh, mm-hmm. to do that. Was, was your intention in going from, te- it was North Texas University, that's where you, were, you did your undergrad, coming out to UCLA, were you intentional about seeking out Walford as a mentor? Like, did you know about him and that's what attracted you to come to UCLA? Oh, absolutely. So there were two people in, uh, in Los Angeles uh, that were essentially 
I think, at least in my view at the time and the view of many, the two leading people in the world for aging research. And LA mm -hmm. um, always had this for some reason. I'm not sure if it's Hollywood or, or what it is. Yeah, everyone wants to be parentally young. Yes. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and so interestingly, the, the scientists that were attracted to LA were also attracted to be leaders mm -hmm. in this field. And so Roy Walford was one, and the other one was Caleb Finch at USC. So I, I, I visited both. I applied to both programs, and eventually I chose to go uh, to UCLA. Uh, but, um, and, and, you know, at USC, uh, that's where I'm, I still am, um, already uh, for decades had a, uh, a comprehensive aging center, which is unbelievable if you right. think about that. Uh, this building uh, called the Andrews Gerontology Center was built in the 70s, and the center was actually established in the 60s. Mm. And um, yeah, the, that's quite traumatic because, you know, what people probably don't know, I mean, there's so much interest around what you do now, but uh, there were many years where you struggled to get your work published and just people were not keen on on hearing what you had to say. So, you know, what was the status of, you know, academia with respect to aging research, longevity research then? Like what was Walford doing versus like what's happening now? Yeah, so uh, when I talked about Walford now, everybody, all the journalists and everybody uh, says, oh, he's a hero. Mm. And back then people made fun of Walford. He right? was like a, like a whack job. He was, he was viewed by his own colleagues at UCLA as out there. I remember when I was in the biochemistry department, uh, the comment when I said, I'm going to go to pathology and work with Walford. And they said, we don't even know what they do out there. You know? <laughs> out there, you know, this is Also, he's doing the experiments on himself too. That's always a red flag. Yeah, Walford yeah. was doing the, the experiment on himself. And, um, and in fact, uh, uh, that experiment on himself might have cost him his life uh, mm -hmm. because he, he, uh, he went for two years in this place in Arizona called Biosphere 2. Him and other seven people. That's when I joined his lab. That's where he was. He was locked up in this uh, sealed environment in the middle of the desert. And, uh, and many of us suspect that, um, you know, and in, in that place, he started the first human color restriction experiment mm -hmm. on himself and the, these other seven people. And we suspect that that might have cost him his life. Uh, he developed Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, and uh, which is a motor neuron disease. And I mean, nobody knows for sure. He may have developed it for some other reason, but uh, there were some harsh conditions in that, in that biosphere too, yeah. uh, between diet and, and oxygen being low. Um, it's, it is very possible that those, uh, those conditions uh, uh, led to his uh, motor neuron disease. Yeah, but like all pioneers, they have to test the outer limits, right? They got to they gotta push that envelope to see what's possible. Absolutely. And, and Walford, I think, um, I think when he came out, he was in, in bad shape, but, uh, uh, and he, he, he was having doubts because at the time, even that operation was not really viewed as, is this a good idea? Was it a mm -hmm. stupid idea? Uh, now I think most people view it view it as a as a you know pioneering uh, operation or, or, or event and and so I think if I think by the time he died um, he was proud of, of of what he had done. I'm not sure that he was that sure when he came out in, right, in right, 1992. Right. So before we kind of get into what you've discovered through uh, all of your research into into this field perhaps we should define our terms a little bit. Like what, what is aging? What causes it? What exacerbates it? And what have you discovered can perhaps uh, slow it down? Yes. So um, aging is actually, uh, and I started the book by talking about that. Aging is actually not a bad thing, right? Uh, I mean, uh, violins age, age and they get better, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and marathon runners, uh, they get better, uh, at least for a while, as they age, and then uh, you know maybe the, the peak performance uh, the, for a marathon runner peaks around 32 to 35, which is very different from other athletes. Um, senescence is really the word that that deals with changes that are detrimental, so ac accumulation of damage and other uh, dysregulation that leads to dysfunction. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the, the word senescence. Usually we use aging because people, everybody. Uh, understands that word better, so it's fine to use aging. But uh, yeah, so as time goes by, uh, systems um, become uh, accumulate damage, 
um, and they be, start becoming dysfunctional. Why does the body suddenly become less, de- less adept at repairing that damage? Well, I mean, uh, there are a lot of theories uh, of aging and a lot of uh, people, most people have focused on the aging part itself. Uh, I uh, come up with a term which I call juventology or juventology. Mm -hmm. And the difference is that I focus on what is the program that keeps you young versus or what is the process that makes you old, right? So it's very different. different. So in my Gerontology versus juventology is sort of like the study and science of health versus the study and science of disease, which is really the model, the model of Western medicine. Yes, yes, in, in a sense, I think so. Because if you're studying um, things going wrong, aging, right? Then you focus on the de- deterioration. So for example, if you think of a car, and that's one of the pillars that I talk about in the book, you, you can study the tires and you can say, okay, I'm gonna learn everything about the rubber how the rubber gets older and older and how to make it not get older and older. Mm-hmm. But I can come around with juventology and say, why are you worried about that? Uh, just change the tires. <laughs> right. Do 50,000 miles and, and put a new set of tires on. Now all of a sudden, all the research, you can see how it's pointless, right? Uh, you just have to find out how to, how to replace right. the tires. So you got to figure out how the body can produce new tires, right? Which gets into this stem cell regeneration exactly. work that you do. Yeah. Um, super interesting. What, what do you, before we even get into that, into the next thing that I want to talk about, it just occurred to me, like, what, what do you think of this trend amongst, uh, the new kind of billionaire elite to like try to live forever? And, you know, the things that Peter Thiel is looking into and funding, you know, whether it's cryotherapy type science or, or other. Yes. Um, I mean, <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I've been told that Walford uh, was on, on the list to be uh, cryopreserved. Oh, wow. And, um, and I, I was also told that eventually he removed himself uh, from the list, right? So I think it's very meaningful, this, this decision. Um, and I mean, I think all of us went through a period of, of thinking about immortality. I think, mm-hmm. you know, when I was 20, I was probably thinking the same way. Um, and then eventually you start realizing that that's probably not uh, why we're here. And there is something fundamentally, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, just uh, in, impossible about it, right? Uh-huh. You just, uh, it, it's not consistent with life on, on earth. Right. Um, and so, uh, and I'm not sure that, uh, and I think that's probably what Walford thought um, that would he want to wake up, you know, in 20,000 years or 2,000 years and find himself in the middle of God knows what. Uh-huh. Uh, Do you think about the implications of your work as it sort of exponentially develops that that could be a possibility for human life? Yes, but I think, uh, um, you know, first of all, we really been focusing, even though, you know, we did extend the lifespan of a, of a yeast by tenfold. So certainly we could move in that direction much more and continue and say, well, if we are able with a microorganism to extend the lifespan mm-hmm. by tenfold, couldn't we do it with humans? Uh, but we, I decided a long time ago that I didn't want to do that anymore, um, that I was much more interested in getting everybody to be 110 healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like this Salvatore Caruso, who's uh, from the same town as my grandfather, was this little town in in southern Italy that has record longevity. Uh, they usually have you know between two and four centenarians out of two thousand people. So it's one of the highest in the world. And Salvatore Caruso made it to one hundred and ten healthy. Uh-huh. And then I also followed Emma Morano in northern Italy up to a few months ago. Emma was the oldest person in the world and the oldest in the history of Italy. And uh, she was one hundred and seventeen and still eating on her own. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, she wasn't completely independent, but uh, uh, mostly independent or mostly, uh, you know, able to uh, operate and do almost everything in, within, in the house. So I think that that's really what we're, uh, what we're studying now. Um, that's, I think, uh, that would be a much greater achievement than, than try to make people live 10 times longer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So your, your research begins with yeast cells. It moves on to mice and then ultimately to humans. What is your approach and what do you begin to learn? Yeah, so with Walford, um, we were doing a lot of 
comparative biology. So you take a mouse that you starve, and I mean, you calorie restrict them, one that you don't, one old, one young. And then after a while, I thought, I'm never going to get anywhere with this. Uh, we're just going to have a lot, of, a lot of differences, but we don't know what they mean. We mm-hmm. don't know what to do with it. Uh, so that's when I went to back to the genetics uh, and me and maybe a group of, of 10 scientists in the United, mostly in the United States, a few in Europe, decided let's go to fruit flies, yeast, worms. And, uh, and they're so simple that we're bound to figure out the age fairly mm-hmm. quickly, get, uh, identify genes that regulate their aging quickly. And then if we're lucky, we move back to, to mice and humans. And, uh, and people thought it was a joke, right? So people thought it was mm-hmm. a stupid, I mean, some famous scientists in the field thought it was the stupidest idea they've ever heard, you know, that, that, that you could work in a yeast, a unicellular organism. And that will somehow tell you um, our human age, right? In fact, a lot of people still think it's a joke, but uh, most it's people don't know. It's funny that people think that though, because it's a fundamental question that we all would like the answer to. Yeah, it's a fundamental question, but also you think about yeast as some kind of ancient organism, but these organisms have evolved for as many billions of years as we have, right? I mean, you know, we are the results of the same evolution process and and their ancestors are our ancestors. Um, So they're quite sophisticated Uh and they obey the same rules as human beings, meaning like um, the force of natural selection. So this process that keeps an organism young for a certain period of time um, is very is the same. It acts in a different way in a, with a different period than a yeast. So in a yeast, you just need six days. If in six days, you basically can reproduce enough time to get out of the way. Mm-hmm. And for, for us, it's more like 50 years. Um, and uh, But the rules are the same. And, and in fact, it turned out that the genes that we and, and uh, others identified in, in these simple organisms uh, were the ones, the same ones that control aging in, mm-hmm. in mice or very, very similar. And we now have, you know, from our own work, evidence from uh, genetic uh, mutations in humans suggesting that right. uh, the, the humans have certain uh, similar genes to the ones that we identified in yeast uh, uh, deleted. Um, they, uh, they're they protected from aging. Right. So what is the structure that you set up to try to determine what keeps a cell young or what can sort of increase its longevity? Yeah, so the, the, the beginning, it was use this simple organism and use genetic uh, uh, tools that at the time were only available for yeast, for baker's yeast, right? So for example, we are for one of our first studies that we published in science, um, in the science journal, um, was uh, uh, let's delete every single gene in the genome, which is about 6,000 genes, and see which one is becomes most protected against toxins, right? Mm. Multiple toxins. And then the, the, the hypothesis was if something is super protected against damage, it's going to be protected against aging. And that worked out very well, and that led to the identification of what's probably now recognized as the most important uh, pro-aging path, which is the tor assist kinase uh, pathway. And, um, and, and so that was one strategy, use the tools, genetic mm-hmm. tools mm-hmm. that we had. And the other one was, because I was in the Walford lab, and we had some people, uh, lots of people working on, on, the, on the molecular biology of aging, in, and the molecular biology of yeast, not aging. Nobody cared about aging at that time. Um, but, uh, uh, for example, upstairs I had somebody called Fuyu Tamanoi, and he was working on, on RAS. And we, the field that described how RAS uh, reacted or was activated by sugar, right? So then I, started, I came out of the Walford lab. I say, if sugar uh, activates RAS, and color restriction extends the lifespan of all these organisms, then it must be that if I delete RAS, the yeast are going to live longer. So this is a biased mm-hmm. approach versus what I said earlier, which is completely unbiased. And sure enough, you know, now they live a lot longer. They live two or three times longer just by deleting this sugar gene. So now the torus cyscanase is the protein pathway and the P- RAS PKA is the sugar pathway. Right. You delete both of them, you get tenfold lifespan extension. Wow. And then you then step it up and and apply this to a rat population. Yeah. Then then you uh, apply it to uh, in, in our cow case a mouse population. Also knowing um, that the data from, from from Cynthia Canyon, Gary Ravkin, and others 
um, in uh, worms and flies, right? Which was matching. So everything was starting right. to make sense. That was all aligned. So TOR was causing aging in all these organisms. If you activate it, and if you did protein restriction, the organism will live longer, right? Mm-hmm. So just protein restriction. Um, so, yeah. So then you do the work in, in mice. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you do the work uh, with nutrition and say, well, if having, uh, if deleting the protein gene and the sugar gene makes the organism live longer, uh, what if I just uh, remove sugar and proteins? Mm-hmm. And then you go in proteins to say, well, do I need to remove all proteins? Maybe not. Maybe just certain amino acids that are contained in proteins. So we remove serine, threonine, and valine, three amino acids, and show that those were the ones, the major ones that mm-hmm. control mm-hmm. Uh, the, the TOR gene, right? So, yeah, so then we started really having a much more sophisticated understanding of all the network that controls aging in yeast and mice, uh, but also uh, understanding of the nutrients within food that controls the genes that control aging. Right. And then, so then with this population of mice, these studies that you were conducting, how much longer were they living? So the, the, uh, the mouse work was originally done by Andre Barkey and, and John Kapchik, and these mice remarkably lived up to twice as long. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's very mm-hmm. remarkable for a two, two and a half year mouse to live five right. years now. Right. And, uh, and but that would be uh, the equivalent in a human of how much longer? Well, this would be equivalent to humans living an average to 165 years of age. Wow. Wow. And, um, and so this was obtained by a combination of uh, mutation and nutrition. Right? So restriction of protein, restriction of sugars, and the mutation in the growth hormone in this uh, master gene that control both TOR and PKA. Right, right, right. right. And, um, and so then uh, eventually we, we knew about the yeast uh, tenfold longer, the mouse twice as long, uh, to live twice as long, and then we eventually start studying this population in Ecuador that was lacking the same gene, the growth hormone receptor, that the mice made the mice uh, having this record longevity. And, uh, and sure enough, you know, uh, they had a terrible diet, by the way. <laughs> when we How were, did you figure out that they had that same genealogy? Well, uh, there was an endocrinologist, Jaime Guevara, down in Ecuador that had been following them uh, because they, were, they have a, 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 a small stature phenotype. They're, they're small. They're about three mm-hmm. and a half feet tall. And, um, and so he was studying them uh, because of that, right? The growth. He was trying to get them to be taller. Right. And uh, so uh, he was following a hundred of them. And, and to me, it was just an incredible opportunity. So I remember when, when uh, Hasi uh, Cohen at UCLA told me, you got to call this uh, Jaime Guevara because he's following a hundred of these uh, subjects and he knows each one of them by name. Uh, so he immediately invited him at USC uh, to give a talk. And then I, I went down there and then eventually it took us five years. And he always complains that it took us too long. But it took us five years to publish the first paper uh, in science, uh, translational medicine, uh, showing uh, protection from diabetes and cancer in this Mm -hmm. population. Um, But they were eating a terrible diet. And then you went down and like, what was the protocol that you that you apply to that population? Yeah, we didn't apply any protocol. Uh, The the um, the task was to, um, in a way, without affecting anything that they do. Uh, randomize them in a sense, right? So having relatives against them, right? They live in the same houses, eat the same food. What uh, are the relatives uh, dying of and at what age? And what are the, the this group that are, it's called GHRD, growth hormone receptor deficient. Uh, what do they die of and at what age? And so it looked like, uh, at least in 2011, there wasn't a single uh, cancer death. Mm that we could find either in these hundred subjects in, in, in the Ecuador, nor in the 250 subjects that uh, Svilaron had been following in Europe and the Middle East. So out of 350 people in 50 years of observation, not a single cancer that. Now wow. that happened later, uh, probably due to this terrible diet, you know, at a certain point, these genes are not right. able to create immunity against cancer. But uh, in thus far, there's been uh, three cases of diabetes Again, out of the 350 or so subjects, which is another extremely low um, uh, prevalence of diabetes, considering that they have a terrible diet, a lot of them are obese and overweight. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so then, then this mutation in humans seems to be very much behaving like the 
the mouse mutation, which makes them uh, protected from diabetes, protected from cancer, the mice, and uh, also uh, very long lived. Now, the longevity, uh, we don't see uh, a big effect on longevity. There's probably a small effect on longevity, but we suspect, as we know for mice, that by having a terrible diet, this may be um, not removing the protection against diseases, but removing this uh, record longevity that Right, right, uh, right. So you deduce from that what, and how does that inform like the next chapter? Well, for, from that, we we deduce that um, it works, right? It, it's not a mouse or a yeast uh, uh, finding. This this is this is going after cellular protection, multi system cellular protection across the board. So so then um, these mice that could get to fifty percent longer life but have health of the cancers and protection from diabetes, from protection from inflammation, protection from cognitive decline. Their brain worked better, longer. And wow. we also show that for the humans. So now all of this uh, is possible. You, you're starting to say, well, uh, we don't have to be this uh, you know, Western world of uh, living long, very sick now. You know, mm-hmm. We used to live a little bit shorter or healthier. Now we live longer, sicker. And uh, um, we can live longer, healthier. So the opposite of what we are obtaining now. So now we're keeping people alive with lots of drugs, right. lots of intervention. Yeah, the idea that extending longevity will only extend the period of time in which you're sick is the paradigm you're trying to upend. Yeah, we want to mm-hmm. turn it completely around. Right. So not only we don't go to higher, because of course, as soon as you start saying, we want to make people live 20 years longer to 110, let's say 30 years longer than now, right? Uh, people are going to say, no, absolutely not, because they think of all the people that they know. Right, you're just they're all in, sick. In you know? old folks' home the whole time, you know, unable to walk. Yeah, So, but if you look at Emma Morano, who at 112 could still live in, in her house alone, right? I mean, she didn't live alone, but she could have if she wanted to. I mean, she had people that came. Uh, but I think until 105, 106, she was alone, uh, living alone. Um, and, um, yeah, and also if you saw Salvatore Caruso at 110, you think that's pretty good. Right. Uh, I, don't, I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I want that. I mean, Salvatore, yeah. uh, you know, in the, in the latest years, uh, you know, television used to come and National Geographic came and they did a, 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 a cover story on him and not just him, but, uh, centenarians. And, uh, and he loved it, you know. He mm-hmm. was so happy that... Uh, that uh, He's getting so much attention. He's getting attention, yeah. but he was healthy, you know. He, yeah, could, yeah. he could come out and, and walk and walk with the television uh, crews. And, um, and so, yeah, he was healthy enough to really enjoy all this attention. So Dan Butner's a friend of mine. He's been in here a couple of times. So we've talked extensively on the podcast about the work that he's done on the Blue Zones. And, and your work really intersects with his work, you know, in a, in a very beautiful way. Um, you're looking at the same or similar populations of people, uh, evaluating what is contributing to their health and their longevity. And, you know, when you talk to Dan, it's a, it's a, it's con, it's confounding factors. It's, it's diet, it's lifestyle, it's community. It's making the healthy choice, the convenient, the easy choice. It's, you know, continual sort of movement throughout the day, but nothing too crazy. Nobody's on treadmills or going to the gym. They're just active throughout their day. They're engaged with their relatives and, you know, their their sort of neighbors in a way that we're not the way that we live here. Uh, a lot of these communities, uh, you know, have a strong faith component to them. Um, so you kind of surveying all of this and thinking about what you're doing in the lab, um, where do you start to uh, look at, all right, well, I can, I can sort of deconstruct all of these factors, um, but it's really the nutrition piece that you zero in on and you can kind of extrapolate from the essentially Mediterranean diet that most of these people are eating, uh, very low protein, not very much meat, lots of legumes and nuts and seeds and vegetables and the like. Um, does that like where does that where does Dan's work intersect with yours and like where do you then kind of take it further? Yeah, so Dan is a friend of mine also, and I think he's done great work, and uh, and we uh, see the blue zones and other areas of the world that are um, they have record longevity as one of the major pillars. So in the book, I talk about five pillars, mm-hmm. and that's one of them, right? So the centenaries are, are one. Um, but there are other four pillars. And, and, and why is this important? For example, one of the other pillars is epidemiology. Why is it important? Well, epidemiology is really 
looking at large population and saying, okay, what if you had low protein versus high protein, low fat versus high fat? Who, who does better, right? So a few years ago, we published a paper um, they got a lot of attention where we say we went against the idea of high protein diet, but we went against it and we went for it at the same time, right? And this is where the sophistication of, of the multi-pillar strategy comes in, meaning that up to age 65, the low protein plant-based diet seemed to be ideal. After age 65, that was not the case anymore. And so people- yeah, Your protein needs become more important. Yeah, and we also show why, because we had mouse and human data in the same paper. And if you took a mouse, a young mouse, and you give it extremely low protein intake, 4% of the calories coming from protein, the young mice did perfectly well. Then you took old mice, and you give 4% protein, and they started dropping weight very rapidly, right? That's where the, the science, and this is just one of the four, four extra pillars mm -hmm. of science that, that we use. This is why it's so important. Now, if you look at, you know, for example, Colin Campbell has always talked about low protein diets, right? But he's always talked about two problems, you know, and, and, and I really think he's been a pioneer in the low protein, but you cannot have, and this also happened with the color restriction field, good and bad. You give something that is good and it's bad at the same time. If the end, it neutralizes, it's a neutral effect. So what's the problem with saying eat low protein, go with the only population studies? The problem is that you don't see, for example, that you can make somebody so weak that their immune system shuts off um, when they're 82 uh, because they thought the protein is always bad. Another thing that is not bad, for example, and there is different phases of life is weight. If you are overweight when you're 50, it's clearly bad, mm -hmm. right? Or obese. If you're overweight when you're 82, it's actually protective, right? Mm. So a slight, not obese, but certainly in the 25, 26 BMI, that's actually a good thing, right? So low protein, high, uh, moderate protein, low, low protein up to age 65, moderate protein, uh, vegan, let's say up to age 65, or pescatarian, fish plus vegan, uh, uh, plus vegetable up to age 65, and then maybe expand a little bit. These are all tricks that come from really putting all these pillars together. You may not see by just going to Italy. Uh, for example, Italy, very few people, uh, Italy, and I'm assuming Greece, uh, are, are very frail populations when they're old, right? Very few people know this. Mm -hmm. So these, these, these Italians that live so long in Sardinia and Calabria and other areas are actually very frail, frailer than the people in Northern Europe, right? And that comes probably from this continuing this low protein diet and continuing this um, narrower diet that is so helpful when you're younger and now it becomes detrimental and makes you weak when you're older, right? So it gets Yeah, I got you. Trickier. I got you. Yeah, I mean, basically, like, like everything, it's more nuanced and complicated than we want to believe. You know, we want to reduce it down to one core principle that's applicable to everybody, no matter what age or how they, where they find themselves in life. Is there a difference between, so on this, on this idea that when you hit 65 and as you start to, you know, move in that direction where your protein needs become more important, um, has there been any work done on the differences between animal protein and, and plant protein? I mean, you, do, you no, certainly I, don't want to be taking in a lot of IGF-1 when you're older, right? You're going to be more susceptible to cancers well, and the and like. Not necessarily because now, and that's what we showed in the paper, the IGF-1 is so low because of age that eating high protein or low protein made no difference it's in IGF-1. So the people that had over 20% of the calories from protein and the people that had less than 10% at the same levels of IGF-1. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, so I think that um, it gets much trickier than, than we want to appreciate. Another issue, for example, that I under uh, discussed in, in my book, but I think it should be uh, much more discussed is autoimmunities and immunities and allergies, right? So you can have a vegetable-based diet, but then whether it's gluten or it's lactins or it is so pro-inflammatory vegetables to a percentage, which could be a significant percentage. If you think about autoimmunities are increasing at a rate of 17% in the world every year, right? It's a huge increase. So, mm -hmm. so this exposure to a lot of this uh, uh, potentially or apparently uh, healthy foods to some people, and it could be quite a big number, uh, can be detrimental, right? So this is why in the book, I start talking about gluten and talking about lactose, but I say really got to pay attention because you you may think something is super healthy for you and that's something maybe killing you. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you, you need to find out, are you autoimmune, allergic, intolerant to something? And, and that something may be 20 different foods, which are all vegetable, by the right. way, right? Right, right? So so if you don't remove it, you're going to have a problem and you're going to suffer. And in a clear case, I always talk about Italy in, in the lactose years. I used to go to Italy and I said, this is really incredible. And uh, because uh, 90% of the Sicilians are lactose intolerant. Uh-huh. And yet... For until five years ago, I never seen a, a, a coffee shop in Sicily that serves uh, a soy milk or, uh-huh. or almond milk. They had the regular milk. So I said, you know, everybody that is drinking this must be <laughs> suffering. <laughs> yeah. and, and so you have a whole, you had a whole country uh-huh. that was getting the macchiato, the lattes, you know, and they were all cow milk. And they must, uh, this must contribute to uh, an, an, an epidemic of gastrointestinal disorders right. They were very obvious because on paper we knew uh, that they were lactose intolerant, and yet nobody, nothing was done for <laughs> nobody decades. Was yeah. Doing anything about it? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. pretty funny. All right, so on this idea of the five pillars, um, you know, let's talk about what we can extract from the research that you've done and what you've learned, uh, you know, into some principles that can kind of guide us in the direction of promoting longevity in our own lives. Like, what's most important? Um, I'm asking you to be reductionist after my my uh, my speech about how we shouldn't be reductionist. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, so you're asking about the most important. Well, things yeah, I, I just want to kind of move into this area of of you know what people should be aware of and some habits and some practices that they can adopt and also things to avoid so that people can be more mindful of you know how to practice uh, you know these principles that you speak about. For their own well-being. Yes. Yeah. So then number one, I think, is a pescatarian diet. Uh, why is that? Well, um, if you uh, are vegan, lots of times you hear people saying, oh, I ate uh, 30 grams of garbanzo beans or chickpeas. That should be enough proteins. It's not, right? You need about 10 times as much as that. I've uh, been vegan for 11 years. No, no, no. Sure. You can be vegan and do very well, but most people out there are not you. Mm. That's what, that's my point, Everybody right? Everybody always tells me I'm an outlier. I'm not convinced about that, Walter. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm saying vegan is perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that being vegan and healthy is much harder than people think, right? Because, for example, it takes about 400 gra- grams of chickpeas to have enough proteins, right? And a lot of times, it, forget you, let's say we pick 10 vegans out there, right? At random. We pick the first time we can find and we start asking questions. I do this all the time. And you'd be surprised how many times you, you, you say, well, you haven't had B12 in a while and, and you haven't had enough proteins in three or four days and, uh, you know, problem after problem after problem. So I'm just saying, if you're going to be vegan, great, but you got to pay attention. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think, look, I take a B12 supplement like, I don't know, once a week at most. I have my blood work done. It's fine. I go out and I do these crazy ultra endurance races. I'm able to compete. I'm 51. I'm, I feel good. I've never had any problems building lean muscle mass or recovering in between workouts. So I, I think there's a lot of misconception out there about protein. And I think one thing we can agree on is that most people are eating too much protein. Um, there's plenty of plant foods that, that meet my amino acid needs. I'm not eating buckets full of garbanzo beans, but you know, yeah. I'm mindful about it. I think I, I would concede to you that that um, it's easier and easier to eat a very nutrient poor vegan diet, especially with all the analog products that are coming out and people moving further and further away from, you know, sort of uh, nutrient dense whole, whole plant foods. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we're in the, on the same, same uh, choir, right? So, yeah. so absolutely. I, you know, um, I published on that and I got attacked for talking about low protein diet, mostly vegan. Uh, but then again, the um, when you allow people to have also fish in the diet to the big population, it makes it much, much less likely that they're going to lose a lot of lean body mass, that they're going to struggle, and also makes it less likely that they're going to switch back, right? Mm-hmm. So if you say, I'm going to allow you to have fish plus uh, a vegan diet, lots of people are fine with that. If you remove everything, then 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 it's just uh, harder for people. Now, if somebody can be vegan for ethical reason or whatever, great. I mean, I think it's absolutely um, uh, doable. Uh, there are no no reason not to be vegan. It's just uh, that you have to pay attention. Yeah. I think that we would also agree that 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 uh, this protein obsession that we find ourselves in the midst of is 
is really um, a red herring. I mean, most people, people are walking around worried about their protein intake, Where, <laughs> when in truth, they're probably taking in two to five times more protein than they need. And well, yet absolutely. every product at the grocery store you know, is emblazoned with a, a message about how much protein it is, you know, with the implication like, oh, we must be not getting enough or we need more. And what I like about your work is you, you stand in, you know, contraposition to that idea. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I'm, I'm the first one that will say we're going to have an epidemic of over protein or eating too much protein and we're going to uh, find out the, the consequences very soon. Um, I mean, in our paper, we show three to four fold increase in cancer uh, incidence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and 75% increase in overall mortality in the following 20 years for people that were 65 and, and below. And even for the 65 and above, it was the moderate protein intake. It was not the high, it didn't need to have high protein intake. Moderate uh, was sufficient. I mean, that in fact, in my book, I talk about maybe increase the protein intake by 20% when you get to age 65, uh -huh. 70. Um, below the minimum recommended, right? So yeah, absolutely. Um, but then again, if you look at fish, uh, and I have to go with the science, and if you look at most studies, fish is always on the positive side, beside the mercury fish, you know, the, the swordfish and the well, tuna, etc. problem. Yeah, that but, we're but most studies are showing beneficial effects, right? That's why I have to say, even though some people could argue, well, ethically, you know, may or may not be the, the best idea. Um, but if you look at the science, uh, the fish plus vegan seems to be, to be the way to go. And what is it, I think when you, you haven't sort of said it ex explicitly, but this relationship between meat intake and the incidence of, of cancer, like what is going on there? Because I think when you say that to somebody, like basically saying, meat causes cancer. Is that what you're saying? And if it's not, if it is, if or it, it isn't, like, I want to kind of clarify that. Yeah. I mean, I don't say that now the World Health Organization says that. So does every other major association. I think the National Cancer Institute, you know, now this is uh, USDA, I think is also now reduced the uh, recommendation on, on protein because of that. So red meat, uh, um, particularly is now recognized by almost every major um uh, association uh, specialized in cancer to be a uh, risk factor or certainly uh, something that you want to avoid in, in high mm -hmm. quantities. Um, in our case, you know, we had multiple papers. Um, we uh, and, and uh, um, Harvard School of Public Health uh, published a series of papers, uh, all of them uh, in, in agreement with this idea, particularly for red meat, but just also uh, for pro high protein. So after our paper, we published one with uh, Ed Giovannucci at Harvard and uh, also confirming that the plant-based diet uh, uh, was protective mm -hmm. uh, compared to uh, a variety of, of uh, diets that included high protein from, uh, uh, from animal sources. And what is the, the active component in meat or red meat that's causing these problems? Is it the high density of protein? Is it the, the hormonal uh, breakdown in it? Like what can that be drilled yeah, down to? Yeah, nobody knows uh, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of uh, speculations of some of it having to do with the heme content. And I've heard different stories and, and uh, different hypotheses. It could be, are they fed uh, steroid hormones? Are they fed antibiotics? Uh, who knows, right, what, what uh, uh, is in that meat? Um, and so uh, probably the combination of pro high proteins, uh, but also other uh, molecules that make it into the meat uh, mm -hmm. out there are probably contributing to, to make it very clear that particularly the red meat seems to be detrimental. Right. But in our paper, uh, we showed that all the animal um, uh, high protein diet from, from all animal sources uh, were detrimental right. Um, and, uh, and high plant-based diet was no longer detrimental. High protein from plant-based sources was no longer detrimental for overall mortality. So there's no effect, uh, but it still was, uh, uh, was, um, detrimental for cancer. So mm -hmm. it still showed up you know, somebody had lots of proteins from, uh, uh, from vegetable sources, uh, that still was associated with an increased, uh, and a risk for, for um, cancer, but that was it was in most cases a combination uh, of animal and and plant based. Products. Right, I got you. What about uh, what about saturated fat? 
Yeah, so I think uh, one of the, the points that I make in the, in the book is that this demonization of, of uh, ingredients uh, or macromolecules has been uh, uh, very, macronutrients has been very uh, bad. So um, we should start making distinctions between types of macronutrients. So fats are actually very good for you. A number of studies now looking at the nuts and looking at the olive oil and looking at salmon, et cetera. Um, they're all positive. Um, but when you look at, uh, um, you know, the, the high saturated fats uh, diet, um, then you see, uh, you see problems. Um, now, um, what will happen if you have a, a low sugar, uh, low protein, high saturated fat diet? Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that that would be okay? Possible. I wouldn't uh, go in that direction because uh, uh, we don't have those studies yet. And it's potentially, I mean, if you want to kill a mouse earlier, you give them a high saturated fat diet, right? Right. <laughs> and so. Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of confusion out there right now. I mean, on the one hand, you have people like Colin Campbell, even, you know, Joel Kahn and the others who are, you know, cautioning people against their saturated fat intake and, you know, indicating that the studies seem to point to a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease with the intake of these things. And then on the other side of the fence, you have a whole group of people and some emerging excitement about this notion that everything you ever heard about saturated fat is wrong, that you should be putting butter in your coffee and you should be in ketosis and pricking your finger and, yeah. you know, like taking exogenous ketones. So where, where do you come down on the ketogenic diet? Where do you come down on, on this, this kind of um, dissension amongst health professionals about this subject? Yeah, I call it the 0 0.5 pillar uh, strategies, right? So you come up with a couple of studies showing acute effects. Let's say you eat a lot, lots of butter and after three months, you can look at a bunch of 20 people and they show like lower cholesterol. And this 0 0.5 pillar uh, approach is very dangerous, right? Uh, why is it very dangerous? Uh, for example, if you take mice and you give it uh, a, um, a low, uh, high protein diet, right? And, and relatively high fat, they actually lose weight. Um, and, you know, if you stop the, the study right there, you say, oh, this is a good diet, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, if you continue, eventually they develop metabolic diseases and they die early, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you give them a low protein diet, high carbohydrate diet, they actually gain a little bit of weight. If you stop there, you will say, oh, bad, bad idea. Uh, if you continue, they have less metabolic uh, uh, diseases and they live a lot longer. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so why is it problematic then to have 0 0.5 health a pillar? Uh, well, because you're going to get surprised. Um, and, um, and so if you look at oh, many, many, many studies, m many of which I, I list in my book, um, you see that uh, the, um, uh, the low fat, uh, avoiding the saturated fats, uh, over and over and over is a good idea. Avoiding the unsaturated, the olive oil, uh, nuts, etc., it's a bad idea. So, for example, the the uh, Asterix study in Spain, thousands of people randomized uh, trial. You put uh, half of them on, on uh, lots of olive oil or lots of nuts every day. They had to stop the study because it was unethical for the control group not to have the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. If you look at Esselstyn's uh, work and you look at the uh, Dean Ornish and not just them, but lots and lots of data, you see that, um, you know, having high saturated fat diet is associated with a lot of cardiovascular problems. Now, if you look, go around the world, you look at the um, uh, centenarian pillar, none of them have high saturated fat. Not the Okinawas, not the Loma Linda, not the Sardinians, not the Calabrians, not the Costa Ricans, and not the people in, in Greece, in, in uh, Icaria. Icaria. So, um, yeah, so then you have to say, the animal data doesn't support it. The epidemiological data doesn't support it. The centenarian data doesn't support it. Um, you know, the basic, the basic research doesn't support it. Um, there is really, and the, and the clinical, randomized clinical study doesn't support it. So uh, you have to uh, say, well, in 30 years, when you have, uh, you know, 200 more studies all supporting this, which would be almost impossible because there's already so much negative data on mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. uh, so not, not worth it. Not worth to go uh, in that direction. You can do as well by being on a low sugar, low starch 
high carbohydrate diet. And this is another thing. People, they like to say bad carb, good carb, right? It's not about, again, same as fat. It's about sugars and, and starches, pasta, bread. It's right. not about carbs. Carbs contained in legumes and the carbs contained in vegetables are excellent carbs. Uh, and even the ones from starches, if you have, if you maintain it relatively low, it's fine. You know, it makes your your diet more enjoyable. And so, if you have 50 grams of pasta or rice, that's perfectly fine. If you have 120 grams of that, uh, then you're starting to get into the problem zone, right? So, so I think that that this uh, it, it, we really must uh, start uh, applying this five pillar or not five pillar. People can have seven pillars, you know, whatever they want, but certainly multidisciplinary approaches to uh, determine whether a high butter diet is good or not versus somebody's opinion based on 20 people studying. Right, I understand where you're coming from. I mean, the, 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 you know, the starch thing makes a lot of sense. I mean, that echoes the work of John McDougall. If you talk to Esselstyn though, he's gonna take a very hard line on fats and oils altogether. Like he's advocating for an extremely low fat diet, no oils. Granted, he's dealing with cardiovascular patients that for the most part are in you know, dire need of, of having to reverse some pretty progressed um, arterial damage. So it's a little bit different, but he takes a very hard line on that. Like, what is your perspective? No, no, I know. I discussed that in the book, you know? And so I say, well, that line, there's one pillar line, right? So the line to, to uh, go with uh, low saturated fat is a five pillar line. Mm -hmm. The line to go with no fats of any kind is a one pillar line. Nobody, yeah, nothing right, else supports that. So if you look at, at the uh, Sardinians, they always had lots of olive oil. So there are the Greeks. And I think also the, the people in Costa Rica and the Loma Linda people. So none of them. And then if you look at the clinical data, the other pillar, the Astruc study uh, showing uh, that they had to stop the study against the low fat diet. So the randomization was olive oil and nuts versus low fat diet. So 3000 people or so went on the low fat diet. And, and what was the low fat diet? It was just a suggested to eat less fat, right? Mm -hmm. So now the high fat from olive oil and nut diet was so superior to the low fat diet that they had to stop the study. So yeah, then that's mm -hmm. when you have to say, uh, and, and if you give a high fat diet and now that I'm not sure if they also had the saturated fats in there, but certainly, um, you know, the mouse studies are, I think they haven't really been done. Uh, let's say good fats, bad fats, uh, low carb, low protein. All right. But just to be like totally clear and like drill down on this nutrition piece, essentially what you're advocating is a plant-based whole food diet with some fish in terms of like the best protocol for long-term lifestyle management and longevity. Is that fair? Yes, avoiding yeah. the paying attention to autoimmunity intolerances. And mm -hmm. so, you making, know- Yeah, uh, making sure you're not allergic to certain things. Yeah, and uh, yeah, essentially. And then, you know, once you get to 65, then I, I think that things change and they let's say goat yogurt, uh, maybe some goat cheese and, and some of these ingredients that um, maybe high nourishment eggs, for example, uh, may be a good idea to start uh, introducing them back. Mm -hmm. uh, just because um, you know of what we've seen, this, we've seen this frailty in later life. That uh, you know, if, if your diet is too restrictive, um, you're probably going to suffer from from this uh, uh, malnourishment. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, I've been you know plant based for 11 years, and and when I began this. Journey. I promised to myself that I would be objective and transparent about my experience with it, that if I started to not feel good or if my blood work was reflective of, of something gone awry, that I would be honest about that and make adjustments. That hasn't happened yet. Yeah, but you're um, not 65. Though. No, I'm 51. I, you know, I'm not there yet, but I feel great. Uh, so perhaps because there's a lot of plant-based vegan people that listen to this um, who are thinking, wait, now I got to start eating that? Like, what should I be mindful about if I want to remain on this plant-based path? Yeah, well, mindful of, for example, that 30 grams of uh, chickpeas and a salad gives you about three to five grams of proteins, right? And even if you take the lowest level of protein 
uh, that you can consider. You know, the, the World Health Organization in their studies to maintain normal nitrogen balance, they talk about 0.66 per kilogram, right? So about 0.32 grams of, of protein per pound of body weight right. per day, right? This is official uh, based on studies, right? So if you go much lower than that, you're going to start losing muscle mass. It's right. just a matter of time. Um, so now, of course, if you if you say, hey, what, how much garbanzo beans did I have today? Let's say you're a 120 pound woman uh, that is vegan. Um, you know, you're going to need about 40 grams of protein, 35, 40 grams of protein minimum, right? Um, now in the book, I say, I talk about the fact that, you know, if you have 35, 40 grams of plant-based protein and you do some weight training, uh, that should be plenty. Right? That should be plenty to... Uh, to keep a good muscle mass, but you have to do it every day, right? So this is something that that um, something that uh, you have to continue doing. Otherwise, you might not see it, but year after year after year, you're gonna start losing uh, lean body mass, and then um, you know. And but the problem is also, are you gonna start losing, let's say, immune function? Uh, the, again, it's an age dependent factor. So you might not see it until you're 62, 63, 64. You might see it in 55. You know, you may be that, uh, it may be that. You get cancer when you're 55, and that was due to the fact that your immune system is not working as well as it could have uh, because you're protein deficient or you're B12 deficient or you're vitamin D deficient or you're folic acid deficient. So it's very important to um, to say, let me avoid the malnourishment um, without interfering though, with, the, uh, with beneficial effects. So yeah, without needing to go into an area that um, where the, the protein becomes detrimental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my protein needs on that equation of you know, 0.32, it comes out to about between 60 and 70 grams a day. It's just, it's not that hard. Like I eat some almond butter, I eat oh, yeah. you know, rice and beans, I eat lentils and quinoa and things like that. Oh, as no, long as I'm just eating those foods, like I've done the math and it seems, it, it almost takes care of itself. Like if I'm just eating clean plant-based foods close to the natural state. So it's not about going out of my way to make sure I'm eating, you know, tons of garbanzo beans or anything. No, no, no. I mean, I do that five, five days a week, mm -hmm. right? So my, my diet is plant-based five days a week. There's no problem, but I do pay attention. I know yeah. that a certain amount of, of certain vegetable contains so much protein. Yeah, of course. And, so, of course. and so once you get used to that, you don't have to check anything. So it's very straightforward. I'm just saying that I, I suspect when they compare, let's say, the vegans against the non-vegans and they show that the vegans are not doing better mm -hmm. in those studies, I suspect that's because so many people in the vegan group are malnourished. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see this uh, otherwise, I, I, I think the vegans should do, be doing much, much better than the non-vegans if it wasn't for malnourishment. So if you could turn the vegans into well-nourished vegan, then I think we'll see the superiority that we already see in the blue zones and in Loma Linda, et cetera. Yeah, I, I think that's astute. I mean, I think my fear, and I think it's a very real fear, is that as we uh, continue to produce all of these processed versions of meat and dairy products, that are tasting better and better and better, that people that are entering into, you know, becoming vegan can easily just be eating all sorts of refined grains all the time and cookies and snacks and things like that. And they're, you know, they're like, hey, I'm vegan, it's healthy. When in fact, it perhaps might even be worse than whatever they were doing before. Yes, absolutely. So I think uh, that this is why I talk about, um, you know, once you figure out what the science and all these pillars are saying, go back to your grandparents' table and among the healthy things, pick the ones that were common at their table. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so if you do that, then I think you're guaranteed, uh, especially if you go with the grandparents or great-grandparents, that you're going to eliminate a lot of these, the, these mm -hmm. new processed foods that you're talking about. So, I mean, I don't think there are many, too, too many grandparents that um, ate uh, uh, you know, processed foods uh, um, you know, in the past, so. Right. Uh, there's been much much ado lately about um, the relationship between uh, chronic inflammation and the onset of so many of these lifestyle illnesses that we're seeing. I'm interested in your perspective on that and what the relationship is between inflammation and aging. Yes, that's a little tricky. Um, I think it's clearly there. There is no doubt that in the brain and, and uh, lots, lots of uh, people in, in the Western countries are, uh, have high uh, inflammation, inflammatory markers. Um, 
to me, is more of a consequence of dysfunction than the cause of dysfunction. Uh, so I think that the body, the liver is not working well, and so you start making C-reactive protein as a, as a way to, to respond to, to, to a dysfunctional state. Um, and this is why we developed the, the, the fasting mimicking diet, um, and the idea was to, um, um, you know, we can change everybody's habits, but can we, for example, go after the inflammation, mm -hmm. not just during the diet, but in the couple of months, two or three months after the diet? So is it possible to hit some, somebody with a five-day diet uh, that will have long-term consequences on the inflammatory state, but not just the inflammatory state, but certainly that is one way to, I, I think, assess uh, functionality of the entire system. Right. Okay. So let's let's get into this world of fasting. I mean, when does it first become evident to you that this relationship between uh, cal caloric restriction and the impact, you know, biochemically, positive impacts biochemically starts to percolate into <laughs> your awareness and, and where do you go with that? Yes. Yeah, so, so first of all, a caloric restriction, which is what Walford was doing, uh, which refers to eating, let's say, 25% mm -hmm. to 30% less all the time, it doesn't work, Right. Um, and it doesn't work for some reason we know, some reason we don't know. But even in mice, you know, the original observation were made 100 years ago. And then it turns out that about a third of the genetic uh, backgrounds uh, benefited from calorie restriction. A third were, had neutral effects and a third had negative effects, right? Mm. Um, so I think the, the periodic fasting mimicking diet built on this success and failure. Why do you say success and failure? Success because if you look at calorie restricted people or monkeys, it's obvious that the uh, uh, positive effects are remarkable. For example, in the monkeys that were calorie restricted, the, the control monkey, 60% of them developed diabetes. In the calorie restricted monkey, zero. Mm. Uh, in the uh, cardiovascular disease and cancer, reduction by 50%, five zero, which is incredible. And what kind of caloric restriction this produced was that? 25% wow. in monkeys, right? Um, now, if you look at their lifespan, not change very much, right? So then what does it tell you? It tells you that obviously you could probably cure many, many diseases by doing the right intervention, but calorie restriction is not the way to do it because it gives you as many problems as it gives you solutions. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is in humans and uh, any, any monkeys. Humans, we don't know for sure yet, but if you look at people that are calorie restricted, you know, men that are calorie restricted have BMI of 19, 18.5, 19, they look they're like they're really borderline anorexic. And, you know, and you have to wonder, is this sustainable to, uh, is it a compatible with a lifespan of 110? Mm -hmm. Probably not, mm -hmm. as it wasn't for the monkeys. Um, so that's where then, um, you know, back in the days, I made the observation, if I completely starve uh, bacteria or I completely starve yeast, uh, they live longer and they live stronger, right? So longer, stronger, meaning that you, you hit them with toxins, nothing. They're very strong. And, and both of them, and, you know, if you look at bacteria and, and yeast, yeast is a eukaryote, so they've been separated by hundreds of millions of years. So I started thinking, is it possible that you could do this for every organism and it's going to make it stronger and protect it for a long period? And that's where a lot of this comes from. And so jumping ahead 20 years then uh, is the mouse studies that we first did, which were, you know, what if you take a mouse and you give it this fasting making diet? Why is it a fasting making diet? Is is a... Uh, um, you know, what I was talking earlier about the nutrients determine what genes are activated or not. Right? So if you have a certain composition, low protein, low levels of certain amino acids, um, and then uh, have low sugar, high carbohydrate, but low sugar, um, and high fat, but good fats, right? All that, you put it together, then the response to the system is just like if you're giving it water only fasting. Mm -hmm. You just mm -hmm. would give it water. And you heal for, for four days, and then you put them back on a bad diet. A relatively bad diet. This is a vegan, so four vegan days for the mice, and then you know ten days of a animal-based diet, uh, and then you keep doing this uh, twice a month. Now we show that uh, the mice live longer, about eleven percent longer. But the remarkable part is the cancers were reduced by almost fifty percent. Wow! And uh, and the inflammatory diseases were reduced by fifty percent. Um, and these mice, just uh, their cognitive abilities was uh, was mu much improved, right? So they just look younger, healthier. Um, so they live longer, younger, and healthier. 
Um, then we did the uh, human clinical trial with this prolonged uh, fasting mimicking diet. And we did three cycles once a month, five days, again, vegan, five vegan days uh, of this low protein, low sugar, uh, high good fat diet. And, uh, um, and then we give them 25 days of no recommendation. Go back and do whatever it is that you always done. No exercise recommendation, no food, uh, no uh, nutrition recommendation. And then we, we measure uh, the effects after uh, a, a week and three months after the last cycle. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, I think the, the uh, results were remarkable. Um, so lower cholesterol, lower blood pressure, lower triglyceride, lower fasting glucose, lower inflammation, systemic inflammation as measured by CRP, um, and uh, lower IGF-1, which we believe is the, uh, one of the key markers, risk factors for both aging and cancer. Um, but the interesting thing, this happened much more power, it was much more powerful in people that had the problem to begin with. So if somebody started from an ideal situation, there were a lot less changes mm -hmm. than somebody that started with high levels of this. Yeah, of, of course, market. of course. Um, that's absolutely fascinating. Was there any, um, were you able to sort of quantify when you said, okay, go back and eat whatever you were eating? Were you aware of, you know, the differences in how people were returning to their lifestyles? And was there any differentiation amongst that population based upon their just sort of preset lifestyle? Um, I mean, we knew that, again, the, the people that, uh, for example, had IGF-1 levels of 300, they probably had a very high animal protein diet, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And they responded very, very, very well. Um, we did not follow their diet after, but what we heard from lots of people, and now, you know, the prolonged uh, FMD has been done by over 30,000 people. So we're starting to collect a lot of uh, data from, from people. And a lot of people are basically saying, it's a slow process, but every time I do a cycle, I come back and I don't feel like I have to go back to as much meat. I right. don't have to go back to as much sugar or as many coffees. You know? Well, it's, they've, they've done something for themselves. And so then they, you know, they, they, they're more enthusiastic about taking care of themselves, I would imagine. I think so. It may also be something uh, about, uh, you know, the brain... Uh, uh, realizing it that you can handle. Uh, I always uh, think about, uh, let's say, running a, a 10K run. Uh, the first time you do it, um, you, uh, you, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. And uh, after that, uh, you, you could probably do it uh, multiple times a year and it doesn't seem that hard. I think it's, you know, um, realizing that it's okay it's not that hard, you know, you, yeah. you, you don't <laughs> well, have to have sugar all the time. I mean, time. most people haven't, have never gone and, you know, 24 hours in their entire life yeah. without eating solid food. And, and just the idea of that seems so daunting. We, you know, we, we have this notion that we'll just perish if we do that. And to kind of undertake a protocol like that and go to the other side of it and realize like, oh, that was, I did that, that was fine. Makes you rethink the human body's capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think about, for example, the brain, around day five or so of the FMD, uh, about 50% of the fuel comes from ketone bodies, right? From fat. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in most people, that pathway in the brain has probably never been activated, right? So somebody could be 55 years of age and never once has activated this use of ketone bodies in the brain. Mm -hmm. So then what's wrong with, with exploring the ketogenic diet all the time? The pillars. Uh, so... You know, if you look around the world, a population that are long lived uh, using a ketogenic diet all the time, which in most cases to be doable, have to be a high protein diet. You know, I mean, you could come up with it, but it'd be almost impossible to do like a high fat uh, only, uh, you know, low carb. Right. Uh, it'd be almost impossible. So this will end up being a high protein, high fat uh, diet. And uh, there is really no data out there. Um, and so then it's, you're taking a big risk, right? So right, when, I got you. All right. So the genesis of this is this idea that when you fast a cell, um, something gets triggered in that cell to make it protective and stronger against um, disease and decline. Is that correct? So what is going on cellularly? Yeah. So that's one, what the, that was the initial observation, protection. Then we started realizing it wasn't just about protection, as I was talking about the tires earlier, 
it's about also repair and replacement, mm -hmm. right? Both inside of a cell, whether the cell, if the cell doesn't die, and in, inside of an organ where the cells are actually killed and replaced, right? So now the body, and I, I use the analogy with a wood burning train, and I say, imagine you have a wood burning train that's running out of fuel, it cannot make it to the next train station, so it starts burning its own components. Uh, to get there, right? But of course, the, the engineer that is burning the wood will first go to the ruined chairs that are made of wood and the ruined world, you know, the damaged ones, right? So they take the damaged components and burn those, right? That would make sense first. Then you go to everything else. But the end result is you get to the next station and then you rebuild it, right? Mm -hmm. Now you put new chairs, new walls in. So now you have a, a newer train and you made it there. And that's exactly what the body does. Um, you get rid of a lot of junk inside of the cell, and also inside of an organ. Uh, and it seemed like we published a paper, for example, a few years ago on multiple sclerosis in a mouse and humans. And it seemed like the, the fasting mimicking diet was able to first get rid of autoimmune cells. And it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like mm -hmm. the machinist or the, or the engineer in the train, you go pick the damaged ones. Right? I mean, it would be surprising that after billions of years of evolution, the body was dumb enough to go pick first the, the good cells mm -hmm. and kill them when it knows that some cells are, are, are some cells are precancerous, some cells are autoimmune, some cells are not metabolically, you know, they may be insulin resistant. And that's why we think we see in the human trial this rejuvenation effect. The body seems to be working like uh, when people were much younger. Right? So, uh, so yeah, so essentially, you know, on first glimpse. It's sort of like, oh, the body is cannibalizing itself. That can't be good. But in truth, what's happening is it's purging itself of the cells that are in decline. And in so doing, stimulating uh, stem cell regeneration for these organs and these systems to rebuild themselves with brand new healthy cells. Yeah, not just stem cells. Now we uh, are, are now our new work is looking at inside of the cell, right? So you, like a neuron or a cardiomyocyte may not be may not be killed, but it's now going to regenerate mm -hmm. intracellular, right? So it's going to uh, so autophagy, autophagy, mitophagy, ap apoptosis, is that? No, apoptosis is, is the different? killing of the cell. That we've already shown. What we're now looking at is what happens inside of the cell without killing the cell. Mm -hmm. Can you regenerate the intracellular components? I see. I see. And so, um, in other words, like take the liver, for example. I, th I think, you know, I've, I've read and seen... Uh, where you've spoken about how you undergo this protocol and your organs, your liver will literally shrink, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's because it's regenerating itself and getting rid of the old and in the early processes of building the new. And then you go back to your life where you're eating and it regenerates itself. And it's actually, <clears throat> for all intents and purposes, it's a younger organ. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. So, I mean, obviously, um, for example, we're showing that the white blood cell number declines uh and then and then returns to normal right mm -hmm. so it's not like declines to 20 percent right so you, you're not reducing something by 80 percent you might be reducing it by 15 percent but now 15 percent of the white blood and cells that's a lot. are uh, yeah, yeah exactly uh, but let's say even 10 percent. so 10 percent, and then you rebuild it now if you do this 10 times a year and especially speculating that what we've seen in mice is also true for humans meaning that that the body can detect this is a damaged cell. That's <clears throat> not. Now you get rid of 10%, which might represent 70% of the bad cells, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. We've mm -hmm. never demonstrated that. But certainly we demonstrated that we could take autoimmune mice and, and within uh, so many cycles of the fasting mimicking diet, we can eliminate completely the autoimmunity in 20% of these mice. Wow. And we can reduce it dramatically in 50% of the mice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so... I mean, it's working in a, in a mammal very well, um, and we've shown it with the pancreas. We can destroy the pancreas, make it not generating insulin anymore, and then we start with the cycle of the fasting mimicking diet. These embryonic genes are turned on, and the only time you see this gene turned on in this manner is only when, we're, when the mouse is first born. Right. And so they're turned on, and they start rebuilding the pancreas, you know, and wow. the insulin-producing uh, cells. It's a really remarkable uh, process. Now, you know, in humans... We're, we're starting the trials now. We, you know, there's a lot of work to be done and, and people have to be careful not to think about, oh, okay, now I'm going to, I have diabetes type one, I'm going to go do it. It's, you know, it's still uh, dangerous to do it, 
but looks very promising. And now we're going to uh, start clinical trials on, on Crohn's and colitis, uh, uh, Alzheimer, um, diabetes, uh, cancer. Of course, we've been doing trials for years now. We, we're, we're done with a few of them and, and we're doing more, um, you know, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. What do you think is the the number one study? Like what would be the first study that needs to be conducted to answer some of the lingering questions that you have that you would like answers to? Well, the first one we're going to do where I, I, I think uh, it's going to work because it already worked with a hundred patient clinical trial that we did is uh, metabolic syndrome and prediabetes and precardiovascular state, right? So all the people, which is half of That's the United States, most people, half yeah. of Americans, yeah, yeah. Uh, about a third of Americans are either pre-diabetic or diabetic, about a hundred million people. Uh, so yeah, so we think because we already done it and we saw very clear results, uh, now we're going to do that. We're going to start very soon, about 400 patients mm-hmm. that randomized at USC. And yeah, so that uh, I, we have high hopes that that's the way to go. You know, maybe three times a year, uh, do this, uh, you know, in, in the trial, we're going to do three cycles monthly, mm-hmm. but uh, the, we envision, uh, because in the past trial, we saw that three months after the last, the third cycle, we still, still saw about 60% of the changes uh, remaining. Wow. Right? So then, of course, 60% and they were lower, but were still significant. Mm-hmm. And so we suspect that, you know, it takes about three or four months to to get rid of the effects of, of, of three cycles. So, uh, you know, I think we envision that this be a, a, an option for, um, you know, for doctors eventually to say, yeah, I could give you drugs uh, or maybe I could let the body fix itself. Right. And uh, and see how far you can go with this. And then, you know, if nothing, nothing works, then maybe we can we can go to the drugs versus, you know, going to, go to the drugs first. And yeah, get to the root cause of what's generating this in the first place, as opposed to putting a Band-Aid on it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so this fasting, mnemonic, mim- mimicking diet protocol that that you've developed, it entails, uh, you know, a protocol in which you have, you know, these foods and, and you're on a very strict schedule. And the idea is that it allows you to eat rather than just doing a, a water only fast. Um, but yet you still garner the same benefits that you would um, that you would experience if you were just doing water. So we, it generated out of looking at water fast originally. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no. Um, and uh, now we suspect, and we have data that we are about to publish, that is not just about the lack. It's also about what we have in the fasting making mm-hmm. diet, right? Um, so, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I cannot talk about that. But it looks like um, there are multiple components that we have selected that have actually positive effects. I'll give you one, for example. Uh, we have glycerol in the, in, the, in the fasting mimicking diet. And glycerol turns out to be a byproduct of fat, but also is what's used in gluconeogenesis to make sugar when the, to, to feed the brain. Now, if you don't have glycerol, the body breaks down muscle, right? Mm-hmm. And so one of the observations in the clinical trial, there was no or minimal uh, loss of lean body mass after three cycles of the FMD. And we suspect that, for example, glycerol is playing that part. I mean, I this is just one of the 66 components that we have in there. And then, and this is just, I can talk about that because we already published that, but, but I think it's going to be a lot more than, than that. And always though, never trying to hack anything, right? Mm-hmm. Always sort of thinking, in, like in this case, what does the body make during fasting? Glycerol. Okay, then glycerol it is, right? So we're not trying to come up with something, our version of, uh, so we now have somebody in a faster state that has got glycerol. But people in a fast state already have glycerol. We just make that higher, right? Right. I so, see. so that is our thinking. So it's what we call nutri technology, but it's a nutri technology in tune with evolution, a nutri technology that really respects where this is coming from, understands it, and respects it. You know, because for example, if you try to give, um, and this is silicon, I come out of Silicon Valley, if you try to give uh, uh, ketone bodies to somebody that has a normal diet. Now you could have a problem. You know, I say this is- <laughs> Who's not in a, They're not attempting to get into a ketogenic right. state other than taking exogenous ketones. Yeah, so right. now, and lots of people are doing that yes. now. So now you think about like a hybrid car that is now, you tweak it to work both on electricity and on gasoline at the same time, mm-hmm. right? Well- It's confusing. It's going to break down. Unless you have an engineer reprogramming, it could do that, but, but, it, but the body is not made to do that. It's either fasting or it's not, right? So mm-hmm. now you I have the it. sugar- you put the ketone bodies in there. What's going to happen after five, six, seven years of that? 
I would uh, strongly discourage people from, from doing ketone bodies um, it, during a, a, a standard uh, uh, nutrition, I mean, uh, nourishment state. Right. And why five days? How did you come up with five days as the window? Well, you need to break down, right? You need to deplete glycogen. And then you have about three days where you, you benefit from, break, from now uh, consuming only, and as we shown in the clinical trial, visceral fat, right? So the body now goes exclusively, it doesn't touch the subcutaneous fat, it goes after the abdominal fat as its only or, or major source of energy. Uh, so now you suffer less for the last three days, you break down the stem cells and are starting to get activated and you have enough of a, of a window that you can start rebuilding. If you go much shorter, there's never any destruction, uh, there is never any cleaning up and th therefore there's going to be minimal rebuilding, right? And uh, um, so, and if and, you go longer, well, if you go longer, you got now get in the danger zone, right? You get in the compliance, low compliance zone, and danger zone, right? So now you do it. You need to go to a clinic. Um, so five days um, after over thirty thousand people have done the prolonged diet, uh, we've seen very little uh, side effects that are uh, that are that should be reported, and. Um, and so people can do it, uh, you know, they don't, they, I mean, some people, of course, struggle uh, with it, but most people don't. And uh, yeah, so I think compliance is very important. If people hate it and if people uh, feel it was too difficult, they're never going to do it again. And then, you know, then it's drugs. Right. So, yeah, and that's, that's a, also, in addition to the specific nutrients that you spoke to, just by actually providing people with a little bit of food uh, enhances the, the compliance dramatically, I would imagine. Not just food, but also the selection of food. So we pick foods that, for example, we have these nut bars and they were designed to really fill you up. So it's a kind of fat that it, after a while you're thinking, okay, that's it. You know, I, right, I I'm, I'm not hungry anymore. anymore. It's not very much, but it's made in a way that it, it really makes, I mean, people, again, it's not, a ton of food, but uh, um, it's um, it, it is doable and and is designed to to uh, try to make you as full as possible. Mm -hmm. um, what about people that do do these extended water fasts? Like my friend Ray Cronice, who's been in here, I think he does these crazy. Like I think he's gone like forty five days, and I think there's something powerful about that in that. He can sit here and 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 share his experience of that. That helps people, like we were speaking about earlier, um, snap out of this idea that we have to eat three meals a day because somebody decided that at some point. Um, but you know, I don't I don't know how healthy or unhealthy that is. It sounds like you would be somebody who would say, "Well, he's well into this danger zone," or has he acclimated to it because he's done it a number of times and built up to that? Or what's your perspective on that? Well, my perspective is that, I mean, he's getting into the wall for a zone, right? So he's yeah. basically pushing the limits. Um, and uh, and there are reasons for not doing that that we know of now. For example, uh, Friday, there was a paper uh, published on 15% on calorie restriction long-term. And what happens? Um, it happens that your metabolism now in people slowed past the loss of weight. So now their metabolism, even adjusted per weight, uh, per weight uh, was lower than it was before. So now after 45 mm. days- And it doesn't come back up? For, it, it may not come back up for years. Mm. Right? So now if he does 45 days of fasting, all right, now the body may have no choice but to reduce the metabolism to be as thrifty as possible. Now- you know, and this is why lots of people that go to these clinics and do very long fast, usually the year after they come back with the same weight that they had before, right? So now this, you get into this yo-yo. And the question is, and the evidence seems to suggest that when you go back now, your metabolism is slower. So now you have a problem. You're going to have to eat less than you used to eat before you started this, right? Mm -hmm. All the time. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're going to gain weight. Right. Um, so that, that's another reason. And, and, and of course, the uncertainty What's going to happen after you do this 20 times? Um, we don't know. Right. More studies. More studies, but know, it, the but control it, group of 45 the, days. Are you gonna get, how many people are going to yeah, do that? 45 days, yeah. you're not going to. Yeah. But now I know the, the Bookinger Wilhelmi Clinic in Germany 
they're starting to follow people. They, they do like three weeks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they, 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 they're trying to get as much information as possible. How many times have they done it? Do they have any problems? So that would be interesting. And I know that the True North Clinic up in Northern California, right. I, I, I remember talking to them and they were saying they were trying to collect data on, um, you know, people that have done it many times. And, and uh, they've had great results up there. And I know a bunch of those doctors, they, they've, they've turned people's health around in dramatic ways. I don't know exactly what their protocol is, but- I Water know only. Those. Oh, it is water only. Yeah, True wow. North is water only, it's a tough yeah, one. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> in a clinic, that was fine. You know, uh -huh. in a clinic, you can do water only. Supervised fashion. setting. Yeah, it's medically supervised. You have nurses. Uh, yeah, and, and the same same in Germany. Uh, that, then then it's different, you know. Especially if you're trying to address some uh, some problem uh, that they know how to solve. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to point out that what you're you're advocating and suggesting is very different from something else that's very popular right now, which is intermittent fasting. This idea of going I don't know twelve or fifteen hours. Um, either every day or once a week, or I don't know how it breaks down for for people. But um, I would imagine that your perspective on that would be that, um, yeah, it's fine, but and and maybe there's some benefits to that. But you're not doing it long enough to really create this effect that you're looking to produce cellularly. Yeah. yeah well, first of all. I'm, I you know I just emailed Sachin Panda the other day because he's one of the, the leaders. Yeah, he's in one the, of the guys. Uh, and um, and I said, Sachin, twelve hours is really intermediate eating. You know, it's not intermediate <laughs> fasting. This is what we've always done, right? So why, why are, we, are we calling that intermediate fasting? That's crazy. You know? So, but yeah, people are doing that, and the problem with that is that we're starting to use these words like carbohydrate. You know, and it's the same thing. You know, it, they don't mean anything because if you eat twelve hours, and that's what I point out in the book. If you eat uh, for 12 hours, that's very good. You know, it, it's supported by the five pillars. Stick stick to 12 hours. Don't eat for 13, 14, 15 hours a day. And uh, if you're overweight or obese, eat twice a day plus a snack and keep it 12 hours. Mm -hmm. That's the normal eating pattern. It's not intermittent fasting. Normal now, 16 hours, well, no doubt that uh, as has been shown, you're going to have benefits on weight loss, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody talks about the problems though. Problem number one, uh, gallstone formation. Studies are showing that if you're, uh, you're uh, fast every day for more than 12 hours, you now have an increased chance that you're going to need your gallbladder mm -hmm. removed. Not the worst thing that can happen to you, but also not a nice thing to happen to you. And it gets to about twofold increase in the risk of all gallbladder operation. Um, number two, m several studies showing if you skip breakfast, which most people will do if you go 16 hours, uh, because most people have dinner, um, now you have increased chance of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and overall mortality. Is that, wow, I, I skip breakfast all the time. Yeah. I shouldn't and, admit that, you know, not all the time. And the argument is maybe is the people that skip breakfast have a terrible this and terrible, yeah, we don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's not necessarily bad to skip breakfast, but it's certainly associated with bad outcomes, right? People right. die earlier, not later, mm -hmm. earlier. So then you have to say, um, yeah, it, it, do you want to recommend something that multiple pillars are now, are indicating to be problematic, right? right. right. And and yeah, so that's why, I mean, first do no harm. It's a very good uh, uh, advice, right? And this is what, you know, people learn in the first year of medical school. Uh, so I think that we should always start with that. So you know, first do no harm. Is this uh, associated with any uh, problems? And if it is, Try to come up with something else, you know. Mm -hmm. So 12 hours is great. Time-resistant feeding, Sachin uh, has worked on that. It's shown to be very, very beneficial. So if you take people that used to eat for 14 hours a day, 15 hours, you reduce it to 12, great. Because that's what the centenarians do. That's what every piece of data is suggesting to be uh, very good. 16 hours, not supported, potentially entering the, the problem uh, zone. Right. That's... that's uh... That's good to know. I think that's important information. There's a lot of people just launching into this world of intermittent fasting without really knowing what they're doing. Uh, and I've dipped my toe in it. So, you know, it's instructive to hear you say that. Um, one of the things that I thought was fascinating in reading your book and your work was this idea that, that um, the fasting mimicking diet uh, will have a, will, will make healthy cells more resistant to like, if you have cancer, right, it will make those cancer cells more susceptible to the cancer treatments, to the chemotherapy and the healthier cells, 
um, uh, strong so that they will be able to withstand those treatments. I didn't say that very eloquently. No, no but, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So yeah, then the like we had observed for bacteria and yeast, uh, you take a normal cell, uh, at least in a mouse, and uh, and the early data from clinical studies is suggesting the same. We've shown already for white blood cells, for example, from humans. So if you give them chemo, the good cells know what to do mm -hmm. uh, during starvation. They become protected. They stop dividing or they re reduce growth rate and they enter a protective mode. The cancer cells, by definition, by the way, uh, rebel against this. They cannot. They, otherwise, they wouldn't be defined as a cancer cell. So one of the, the hallmarks of cancer cells is the ability uh, to grow independently of growth factor and to refuse anti-growth signals, right? So to rebel against anti-growth signals. So fasting is an anti-growth signal and the fasting and the cancer cell rebel. Now, you got a problem with that. And I use the analogy of imagining somebody running in the desert, in the desert without shade, right? And without water. Uh, now, if you were running in the desert, like cancer cells do, um, you know, you have shade and water, uh, you may make it. Right. And so if you have, in the case of cancer cell, lots of growth factors, lots of proteins, amino acids, and sugar, fine. That's what they've evolved Continue in. That's what they understand. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start you know, uh, removing glucose and removing uh, growth factors and like IGF-1, et cetera, and adding anti-growth factors, now the cancer cells are going to have a problem. And that's what we see. That's why we see uh, the fasting, fasting making diet being as effective as chemo. But particularly, we see this working together, and that's where the sun comes in, right? The mm -hmm. sun is the chemo. And so, you know, you know, have no water and you have the sun hitting you, um, you're going to be dead. It's just a matter of time. Right. It's amazing how that's worked out, that it has the desired effect on the cancer cells, which is to hopefully make them go away, and at the same time, strengthening the healthy cells. It might have now worked out, it might be evolved, right? Mm -hmm. right? So we're starting to suspect that, think about sleep, right? So you, you sleep and, and sleep is now there by, by mistake, right? It is, it's, it's forcing you to rest for however, however many hours. So we're starting to think, is it possible that because all these organisms mostly stay yeast, bacteria, mostly they stay in a starvation mode. Once in a while, they start eating, right? Humans were not in that situation, but fasting was probably so common that you didn't have to force anybody to do it because they were forced by the condition, right? Mm -hmm. So then what if fasting was the moment where the precancerous cells were getting killed and, and, the, um, and now you use it to protect the other cells in that moment of starvation from the sun, from whatever other you know, uh, problems and toxins you might be exposed to. Um, so it may very well be an adapted process where uh, you're starving, protect your, your, your good cells, protect your genes, and then get rid of uh, cells that are, you know, not functional anymore. Also to eat them, you know. Yeah, in the same way that, that exercise is good for you, right? It's just something that we evolved, that we, that we sort of experienced in our evolution that um, allowed us to, you know, weather hard times and get stronger. But we've moved away from these things. We're in a culture in which we're just eating all day long and we're sitting in chairs. So we've, we've moved away from these evolutionary um, sort of mandates that, that keep us healthy. Yeah, but um, yeah, exercise could be a little bit different. Exercise is not really removing anything, it's more damaging. So uh, exercise may have similar effects for different reasons, meaning that when you, let's say, you had to run excessively 20,000 years ago, that caused muscle damage and the uh, response to that may be build new muscle mm -hmm. because now that tells you that you didn't have enough right so it's a different concept probably also leading there's to sort a of a sort of a catabolic anabolic analogy in that there's a breakdown and then there's a rebuilding that makes you stronger yeah yeah so right. it, it's a similar idea uh but uh but yeah the mechanisms are quite different because in, in in exercise you do damage and then you repair it right. rather than you get rid of and eat yourself essentially right, right. and then I rebuild. You. You know? no, so you, you. But yeah, uh, uh, the, the exercise I think uh, also uh, uses some of the, uh, probably in some cases the rebuilding might use, uh, as we are seeing, similar mechanisms, right? So it might, it, it, the rebuilding for exercise probably doesn't quite go as extreme as the rebuilding after prolonged fasting. 
uh, but uh, it may be used in similar techniques. For example, we know stem cells are activated, satellite stem cells, muscle stem cells are activated in response to uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the impact on cognition of FMD? Yeah, so the, in the mouse, uh, there are very clear uh, impact, um, meaning that they are um, uh, cognitively uh, sharper, they remember better, they learn better. Um, particularly when they're old, and but also when they're young. But you see this particularly when they're old. Now we're doing, uh, we've done some special FMDs with mice uh, on and off um, on Alzheimer's, um, but now we're doing um, the the human FMD. We're testing it now in mice, the multiple Alzheimer uh, models, and the idea is, uh, can we protect the uh, uh, can we protect the brain against uh, Alzheimer, even when we impose the human mutation that causes Alzheimer's in 100% of the mice, right? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, so some amounts is called triple transgenic, and there's all these human mutations that cause uh, uh, problems, you know, this beta amyloid accumulation and tau, phosphorylated tau. Uh, so, um, yeah, so then hopefully within a year we'll have the, the data on that. And we're starting a clinical trial which just got funded by the Italian Ministry of Health uh, for a randomized uh, clinical trial on Alzheimer's patients. Oh, wow, that's and great. And the fasting-making diet, so that, that would be very interesting, Sp particularly because there's really nothing for dementia right now, and um, and uh, so this would be uh, something that could be uh, rapidly moved into the into clinical use. Are you familiar with uh, Dean and Aisha Scherze at Loma Linda with their... Um uh, I forget, I think it's called the Brain Health Unit. Uh, they they created a department there and they're having some pretty tremendous success working with uh, early onset Alzheimer's patients. I had them on the podcast. Uh, they're doing really cool work. You know, I'm collaborating with uh, uh, Charles Wang and, and uh, a few others at Loma Linda, but not with the brain people. Mm, mm, you should meet these guys. I'll connect you. Um, sure. Is there anybody who who, for whom... Uh, the fasting mimicking diet would not be appropriate? Yes. So, uh, you know, pregnant woman, um, weight uh, below, I think, uh, BMI 18.5 or, or something like that. Um, people with diseases, they're going to need the doctor. Or people that are taking drugs, especially metabolic drugs, um, insulin particularly, very dangerous the combination. Mm -hmm. You can actually die if you combine insulin and the fasting or fasting mimicking diets. Um, yeah, so I think in general, uh, if somebody's healthy, um, they can talk to the nutritionist, um, and um, there is an expert in, in FMDs, and um, they will take them through. But if somebody has a disease, they uh, they need to run them by the doctor, and then uh, the nutritionist and the doctor can can work with them mm -hmm. um, to uh, to see if it's doable. Right, and the the preferred the the preferred protocol is to do this five day program three times a year, like once a quarter, four times a year? Well, it depends, right? So if you're somebody who's a 32-year-old athlete that is on a pescatarian or a vegan diet and it's, you know, everything is perfect, um, let's say you probably want to do it twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and somebody who's obese, who's got high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, maybe once a month until they move to the lower category and then it goes, you know, maybe once every four months and then, um, and then every, you know, yeah. So I say on average people should probably do it one, once every four months. And then depending on where they stand between the 32 year old athlete and the, uh, obese right, person right. I got multiple you. risk factors. Yeah, I got you. Um, all right, well, we gotta, uh, we have to wind this down, but I have two questions, um, that I can't let you go without asking. The first is, if somebody's listening to this or they're watching this um, and they're health conscious, they're interested in taking care of themselves, but this is brand new information. They've never heard anything <laughs> like this before. Uh, you know, what's the what's the thing that you want people to bear in mind that they might that might not be self evident to the average consumer about how they approach their their day, their diet, their lifestyle habits. Well, I'm, I mean, you know, I I, um, I have a list at the end of the, the chapter four, I think, in the book, and, and there's 10 things that I think people uh, all should do. They're not very hard. 
And, um, and of course, it, you know, different people will get to different levels of it. You know, so for example, what we talked about earlier, the 12 hour limit, um, you know, if you do 15 hours and I say 12 and you can get to mm -hmm. 13, well, you know, at least uh, you're close, you know, and, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's the idea. I try to get as close as possible to all these recommendations because they're really based on five pillars. I mean, my opinion is in there, but not very much. I mean, it's more like a systematic uh, right. way of, of looking at this, including our history. You know, mm -hmm. where do we come from? Not just systematic in Silicon Valley way of, of, you know, trying to hack everything, but more like, you know, let's combine that hacking with, uh, uh, with our history and where we come from, you know, to make sure that uh, we stay in tune with evolution. You know? Great. That's a great answer. And if you were to... Uh wake up and find yourself to be the Surgeon General of the United States, what would be your primary first policy initiative? Like what needs to change in our healthcare system? Yeah, so I get fired within like a week. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Somebody tell me that. The, the Everybody, is, I ask every doctor that comes on the show the same question. They, I mean, every one of them will get fired for yeah, what they would yeah, want to yeah. make and, happen. But it's funny because... I, I believe that the Surgeon General, when, the, uh, when uh, 50 years ago, said smoking is bad for you, and he was fired for saying that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and it was I think way that's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I think that cool. for sure um, these uh, five meals a day uh, is a bad idea. Um, it's, it's accompanied this obesity uh, epidemic in the United States and around the world. You know, when you have 70% seven, of people in the U.S. that are either obese or overweight and you still recommend eating five times a day, it, it, it's entertaining to me that uh, they don't understand that what could work in a clinic. You know, so if you brought somebody into a clinic, as we do, and you keep them there, then it could, it could actually work. But if you tell somebody eat five times a day, uh, then what happens is they, they start eating more and they eat for 15, 16 hours a day. Yeah, they're not eating a banana and some almonds. They're going to Cheesecake Factory. Yeah, so they're, they're eating the, the bad food and they're eating for uh, more meals, longer time. So the combination of these two, I think, is the bad food, more meals, longer time. The three things mm -hmm. are, are really detrimental. So I would say if you can go to either a vegan or a vegan pescatarian diet, and keep it within 12 hours and keep it to, if you're overweight, if you're one of the seven out of 10 Americans that are overweight, keep it at two meals a day plus a snack. So let's say you have breakfast, lunch, and a snack for dinner or breakfast, a snack for lunch and dinner. Mm -hmm. I mean, a snack could be a hundred uh, calorie, low sugar, you know, like a salad or, 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 or something like it. It's a pleasure talking to you, Dr. Longo. Pleasure I think your uh, your work is groundbreaking. Um, the work you're doing is inspirational. I think we're going to be seeing and hearing from you quite a bit more. Uh, your book, The Longevity Diet, is groundbreaking, and I wish you only the best as you continue to do more research. And it's an honor and a privilege to um, help you uh, get your message out into the world. Um, so thank you for your time today. Uh, if you're interested in uh, Walter and his work, pick up his book, The Longevity Diet. If you're interested in learning more about the fasting mimicking diet, uh, you can go to prolonfmd.com and they have all the information there. You have these kits that you can order. I think it's important to say that Walter himself does not profit individually off of this whatsoever. All of the money that he earns from this goes directly into uh, funding research with what's the organization called? CreateCures.org. Create yeah. so and, and what is CreateCures doing? Well, CreateCures is a foundation that I started with the idea. You know, I had like every day I have 10 cancer patients or people with autoimmunities and whatever, or a disease, and they're like desperate. And, you know, I realized that it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're poor or rich, uh, there is really very little uh, out there that helps you with a, in a, you know, in a serious way and say, okay, you have cancer. I mean, there's a lot of quackery out there, but there's not too, too many people other than the oncology that tells you, here are the drugs we're going to give you, then people were faced with internet. Right. Good luck to you, you know? And so Create Cures is really about what can somebody do today, not 20 years from now, but today that is going to make their therapy uh, more effective. It's going to make the side effects lower. Uh, so it's going to help them. And, you know, in some cases, 
uh, we'll have done the clinical studies in some cases we haven't, but the patient cannot wait. And so we sort of have to act now. And mm-hmm. that, that we, we felt is important. We're doing it all over the world now with many, many different hospitals. And we're starting to see, you know, the doctors slowly being, you know, converted into understanding this, this difficult situation right. where you cannot wait. You cannot tell somebody with stage four breast cancer for whom immunotherapy is not working. Oh, you know, these guys in 10 years are going to have something for you, you know. Right, exactly. Um, fantastic. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and so you're much. you're you're not on Twitter, right? Well, Prolon's on Twitter. Prolon FMD. Yeah. No, Twitter, I have a Facebook Prof yeah. Walter Longo Facebook page where we put just uh, articles about you know anybody that uh-huh. we feel we sort of have a couple uh, nutritionists and dietitians screening papers, and if we feel something is good, you know, then we'll put it out there and and. Uh, uh, and we usually associate it with uh, like an article from a newspaper that describes what it is. Yeah. Cool. So I'll link that up in the show notes. And uh, are you do, do you do you ever like get up in front of public audiences to talk? Yes, yes, I do that uh, from time to time. And um, yeah, so um, is there anywhere where we're doing a also Facebook? Or? We do a Facebook live maybe once every um, couple of months. Oh, cool. Uh, just so people can, you know, uh, ask questions right. and uh, and uh, log in and, and ask questions. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you.